Hey everybody, how's it going? This is Jake with Mind Over Mind, and today I'm reviewing the Bionicle Netflix show Journey to One. It released today, March 4th, and by this point I've seen each episode twice by now, so I'm really excited to share my thoughts. Now I am going to be talking about the synopsis of the plot and some spoiler stuff, but it is Bionicle, it's a Lego product, and it's a little bit predictable, so if you haven't seen it yet and you're really cautious about spoilers, go ahead and watch it on Netflix, come back, watch this video, and just share in the hype. It's gonna be awesome so anyways let's go ahead and start with the prologue now this is something we weren't expecting it's a whole chapter that's about 12 minutes long it summarizes the first two seasons of Bionicle the first one in the winter wave of 2015 and the summer wave of 2015 and it's just really cool to see the animations come back now they did use the 2d style animations um, that we saw in the previous two seasons or seasons it basically is used to recap the events that happened during the first year what I really liked about this is we really didn't hear about this before it came out I mean when I clicked on the first episode and it started with the prologue I really thought it was gonna be the first whole episode was gonna be a recap of the first two seasons and I was like what's like that's kind of sucky to do but like as soon as I found out that it was its own separate thing it made it all the better and the fact that Narmoto was narrating it was really cool and that voice actor was awesome honestly the voice actor who did Narmoto did a killer job and I really want to see more of the protectors uh, in the, the episodes to come even though I probably won't see that but it'd be really cool to see them you know fill the roles of the protectors as we move forward with the series now I do like how the Toa's roles have switched since the first two seasons. You know, Liwa was kind of old and wise and kind of like the the old guy kind of chuckling in the background in the first two seasons, but now he's kind of the more young and playful charismatic character that he kind of portrayed in the first generation of Bionicle. He's kind of returning to his roots, no pun intended. Even though I really am happy with the way that Liwa's character turned out, I really wish they had changed uh, Kopaka and Pohatu's characters. I feel like those two would have been much better if they had switched. I feel like Kopaka was pretty playful and funny at times too, but Pohatu is stern and Narmoto even describes him as brooding and sad. I don't know, that's kind of off-putting to me. I wish they had made him more kind of playful. Like, I feel like Pohatu Generation 1 was a good middle ground between, you know, kind of Liwa and Onua. He was kind of wise, but he was also really funny and playful and he had a lot of cool banter. I wish they had kind of continued that with Generation 2. But hey, he doesn't have that ridiculous Australian accent anymore, so we're getting somewhere. Speaking of Toa personalities, Gali has a female voice actress, and it is awesome. She is pretty great, although at times I do think she's, you know, a little bit young, like the voice actor sounds a little bit, you know, naive and playful, but I think overall I'm just really happy that they ended up giving her, you know, a female voice actress. It's awesome even though the prologue was really cool i am kind of bummed that they didn't reference the lord of skull spiders at all they showed skull spiders um, but they didn't really reference him all that much and i know i'm in a minority but i really like that set and i just wanted to see more of that character i was actually hoping he'd kind of star or not star but cameo in uh, the first episode but he was nowhere to be seen and i kind of wish that you know they had shown him a little bit more but you know, I don't know. I guess we're not going to be seeing much of the Lord of School Spiders anymore. I just really wish that they had added them in there somewhere. Now, before we move on from the prologue to the first actual episode of Bionicle, I just really wanted to say that I'm happy that they described where the new Toa armor came from. Uh, we haven't really seen that in the magazines or any other references, but I'm glad that Narmoto directly stated that Ikimu forged the new masks and armor that the Toa are now wearing in, you know, in Bionicle 2016. That's actually really cool, and I'm happy that they did that. Alright you guys, so if you're still watching and are concerned about spoilers, go ahead and tune off now, but I will say before you go that this series is great so far. I'm really having a great time with it, and it lives up to the hype in my opinion. I really love the first two episodes and the prologue, and I just can't wait to see where the next two episodes lead us. When the credits rolled for the second episode, I was just left wanting more. Like, I wanted to continue seeing, you know, stories play out in that universe, and I really wanted to continue the adventures on the island of Okoto. I really am excited for June when they release the second two episodes, and I can't wait to see more of Bionicle. Man, I love it. I am so happy, and I feel like Bionicle's back. I feel like now, moving forward, Bionicle is almost fully fleshed out and it's just great i'm loving it and i am proud to be a bionicle fan so we're gonna go ahead and get into spoiler stuff and summary stuff so if you're still concerned about spoilers i'm gonna start right now so you might want to tune off but be sure to tune back when you finish the first two episodes all right episode one quest for unity so the episode opens up with all the six toa heroes together and a bunch of skull warriors attack 
Now this fight scene really demonstrates the Toa's abilities. It's really cool to see kind of how each Toa have their own abilities and just how they utilize them. I especially like Onua's, how he uses his rock bending abilities to kind of push the Skull Warrior like from the ground into the rock mountain next to him. It was so cool to see that happen. I'm really excited to see you know, other Toa abilities and how they utilize them in the future episodes. During this scene, we get a lot of comedic banter between the Toa. I really like Tahu uh, in this iteration. He's not super serious like he was in Generation 1. He's not like the cold-hearted leader. But in reality, in this generation, he's more lighthearted, fun-loving, actually. And I just like his comedic nature. He's more charismatic as before, and I love it. I love the change. Speaking of Tahu, he's not super centric in these two episodes. Like, none of the episodes revolve around him, even though he is the face of Bionicle, which is really appreciative, or at least I appreciated it. Like, he wasn't the star of these episodes. It really centered around uh, Liwa. I feel like Liwa got the most screen time, and I really like Liwa, and I love how he was portrayed in this, so... Power to you, Lego. I really like the subtle changes that they've made to the Toa models as well. So if the toy had like gappy armor or holes kind of littered through the set, they covered that up and they added additional armor pieces or stretched out existing armor pieces to kind of cover those gaps. That was really cool. And I still love how Onua is, you know, still hulking, like looming over the Toa, at least by two feet, um, which is really cool. The toy doesn't do that as much, but I'm glad that they kept that with the, the episodes. So of course the Toa defeat the Skull Warriors in some pretty cool ways, and then they set off to find their creatures and masks of unity. During these like searching sequences, we get to see more Toa abilities. Uh, Liwa just darting back and forth in the jungle, being quick on his feet, stuff like that. It's really cool. During these searching scenes, Kopaka tries to concentrate to like see a vision of Melum which he saw previously, and after a while, he's like, nope, that didn't work, <laughs> no good, and I feel like that's just something that, you know, Pohatu would say, I just, I'm still wishing that they had switched those personalities, and I just feel like that would have been better for both of the characters, you know, Kopaka is more cold, uh, kind of soloist, and I feel like the way that these two episodes portrayed Pohatu, I feel like that would have been better suited for Kopaka, especially with, you know, the stuff that happens in episode two. We'll get to that later. Kopaka also has another line where he, like, uses his ice to form an ice bridge, and he's kind of, like, skating down the ice bridge, and he kind of falls off and stumbles and lands it. He sticks the landing, and he's like, oh, that worked out nicely. And then he's like, wait, what am I talking about? That worked out great. And he's like, oh, back to work. Like, I feel like that would have been such a cool line by Pohatu, but... I'm gonna stop kicking the dead horse, like, I'm just gonna stop doing that, I'm gonna stop talking about that, let's move on from the Pohatu personality thing. As the Toa continue on their quests, I can't help but to, like, really appreciate the playful banter that they have, and the commentary that they have, even when they're by themselves, they still, you know, come out to be funny and just cool to be around, like, if the Toa were real people, like, real beings, I would want to hang out with them, like, they're cool, you know? Like, I just, I just really liked, you know, the comedic backgrounds that each of them had. So eventually, all of the Toa find their respective creatures. Some fight them to gain their trust. Some, you know, bow in submission. Some race them like Liwa. And that was really cool to see. So eventually, all of the Toa bond with their creatures. And they all unite with him. All of them, except for Pohatu, who doesn't really like guitar. And who can blame him? Who actually likes guitar? Am I right? <laughs> I'd be pretty bummed if I was assigned to the worst set too. All jokes aside, Liwa eventually comes face to face with Umarak. Umarak captures Uxar and puts him on his back and begins to see the vision that all the other Toa, you know, received where it shows the location of the Mask of Control, which is what he's ultimately seeking for. But before Umarak can get the whole vision, Liwa basically breaks him off his back, which interrupts the vision. Umarak and Liwa then begin to fight, which is super cool because we get to see Umarak's powers and they're actually really awesome. When he's standing in shadow, he can be absorbed into that shadow, and then he can pop up wherever there is another shadow. So he can basically teleport wherever there's, you know, a lack of light, which is awesome. He also can use his bow to spawn shadow trap creatures. Like when he fires a bolt of light, it can like penetrate something and then out pops a shadow trap, which is really cool. I, I really like that stuff. He also can make objects out of shadows, kind of like Green Lantern, like he formed a massive claw that picked up Uxar and brought it to him. So he can manipulate shadow in like a hard light version where he can like make physical objects out of shadow. 
Now to combat this, Liwa basically uses his jungle abilities to spread the treetops, which allows the light to come in uh, to the bottom of the forest, which surrounds Umarak. Now I thought this was a super cool idea, uh, utilizing you know his jungle abilities because he's now the toe of jungle. Um, I thought that was a really cool idea, and because Umarak is surrounded by light, he can't teleport where there is shadow because there isn't a shadow beneath him you know what i mean now eventually the toa all meet up again they're safe they have their creatures they're all happy with the exception of bohatu who reveals that he doesn't like guitar because he doesn't like scorpions that's kind of a throwback i hate scorpios but all jokes aside he is a huge jerk to guitar i mean he is a bad set that's understandable but he's a he's a huge jerk to guitar it's kind of it's kind of messed up at some points especially in episode two liwa then reveals that he you know encountered the big fella with horns now he actually said fella like i suspected in my trailer breakdown yeah it happened he said fella but <laughs> it was good it was good it's really cheesy which is you know something that i kind of expected but i love the cheese just give me the cheese it's good stuff their banter is really funny at times and i enjoyed it even though it was pretty cheesy. Now the first episode ends with the Toa basically resting up to, you know, combat Umarak and find the mask of control for the next day. So it's really cool. And I will say that when the credits rolled, I was excited to see episode two. I was really excited. And the fact that the credits music sounded like the credits of Mask of Light, that was kind of a throwback, like especially with like the drum stuff. And it just sounded like the Mask of Light credits, but revamped. On to episode two, the trials of the Toa. The episode starts out with the Toa kind of gathered together. They're kind of plotting with uh, Akimu. And Akimu reveals that Makuta's spirit is gradually growing stronger as he's employing agents to find the Mask of Control. Now we do see Umarak watching over the Toa as he's listening to their conversation. And he basically summons Makuta and talks to him. And he basically says that he's going to try to find the weakest link to, you know, target that person. He basically wants to find the Mask of Control for Makuta and he's doing whatever it takes to find it. Now as the Toa set off on their adventure, they kind of venture through the jungle region. They actually call it the jungle region. Um, and they're in one of these forests and Umarak launches an attack on the Toa. A beam of light hits Tahu in the chest which becomes a shadow trap creature, it latches onto a Kier, and then Umarak uses the shadows to clone himself to fight the Toa. Now during this fight scene, Umarak realizes that Pohatu doesn't unite with Katar to fight back, so that he identifies Pohatu as the weak link, and realizes that he can easily steal Katar from Pohatu's hands, which gives him the rest of the vision, allowing him to access the Mask of Control. Now after working together, uh, they repel Umarak, who has all the information he wants at this point, and eventually they reach the Labyrinth of Control. Now on their way to the Labyrinth though, they have this really cool race sequence when they're all like using their abilities to race to get to the Labyrinth first. First of all, you know, Tahu's using a cure to fly, same as Liwa, um, but uh, Kopaki uses that same ice bridge strategy he used in the first episode, which is really cool. And I just really liked, you know, this whole sequence. I also really liked how Pohatu uses like a skipping stone. He rides a stone, which he like skips across the water. That was really cool. And Onua just builds a straight up bridge out of rock from the, the waterbed to get there. It was pretty awesome. And I'm a huge soundtrack guy. I, I listened to dozens of movie and video game soundtracks. And the soundtrack that played during this sequence was really cool. And I really appreciated it. It was some good stuff. There's there's a good score with the, the Bionicle series. So once they get inside the labyrinth, they open it up and they experience some Maze Runner stuff as they're going through. Like the maze is constantly shifting and it's just really cool to see, you know, how it's like reacting to them and, and how they're dodging these massive blocks that are kind of trying to block their way. Now eventually they get to the center of the maze where there are six slots for them to walk into. And as the other Toa are walking down the slots, or at least these little stairways, uh, Pohatu stays behind because he doesn't want to unite with uh, Katar. But that's where Umarak strikes. He takes Katar, unites with them, and kind of flies out of the maze, and Pohatu follows him. By this point, it's too late though. Umarak has the mask of control, and he basically lets Pohatu have Katar back um, after dropping him off the side of a cliff. So he makes Pohatu choose, you know, between having Katar or the mask of control. So obviously Pohatu being the hero chooses Katar and Pohatu, you know, realizes that he has to make up with Katar. Like they have to work together to fight Umarak. And that was pretty cool how they realized that unity is the, the key to success. 
as the episode starts to wrap up, uh, the Toa, you know, stand heroically on this mountain. They look over Kodo. I thought that was a really cool shot. They're realizing that this place is home now, and they have to do everything they can to protect it. Now, as the episode ends, it shows Umarak holding the Mask of Control while talking to Makuta. And he basically says, like, I don't work for anybody. Like, this mask is mine. And he puts it on, and it starts to mutate him. Now, we don't exactly see what he mutates into, but uh, we see, like, the shadows on the wall, which is really cool. The shadows are cast by, like, the Makuta fireball that's talking to him. And now Makuta is saying, like, you work for me. You're my, my minion, pretty much. And I just can't wait to see the next two episodes of the series. Of course, they release in June, but we basically know what Umarak looks like. If we look at the Toy Fair images that were released, we can see that his, his he's in his destroyer form, which is awesome. And Makuta also renames him, you're no longer like the hunter, but the destroyer. I thought that was awesome. Um, so I'm really happy with these two episodes, guys, and the prologue, it was really cool. Uh, I'm just so satisfied, but the thing that I realized as these two episodes ended was that I wanted more. I wanted to see more of this universe. I felt like it was finally being fleshed out, and I just can't wait to see the next two episodes. I, We have like three months to wait, but I feel like that's too long, and I'm just... I'm really excited to see where they take it. So it is predictable, it is cheesy, but it's it was really satisfying to watch. Realizing that this project is in the correct hands and LEGO is doing a great job to flesh out the Bionicle universe. What did you guys think about these two episodes in the prologue of Journey to One? I am just personally super satisfied and I feel like I can rest now knowing that you know this project is in the right hands like I said before. Post your ideas in the comments below. What did you love? What did you, you know, just not really care for? I want to read all of your opinions and comments, and I'll be responding to those for sure. Anyway guys, this has been Jake with Mind Over Mind, and I'll catch you guys in the next Bionicle video. Peace out.